My name is Denise Renner, and I am the president and co-founder of Cure Grin Foundation. Um, I co-lead the organization along with, with Keith MacArthur. My son has a mutation in the Grin 1 gene that we um, he was diagnosed right before his second birthday, and he's now eight years old, my son, Brett. And uh, this is the session on the Grin, uh, the uh, Gree gene uh, phenotypes. And uh, what we're looking at here is a result of a survey that we did last year among our, our patient family population. We had about uh, almost 200 families um, respond to the survey. And you can see here the prevalence of the each individual symptom overall grin. Um, this was before we, we uh, expanded into our um, other GRI genes as well. So you'll see here um, GRIN1 genes, uh, the prevalence in, of each of the individual symptoms, GRIN2B, GRIN2A, and GRIN2D. And um, then we moved on to, uh, this is page 24, um, and this is an accumulation of where families told us they wanted us to focus on um, the, the, um, the priorities of uh, treatments and cures. And um, this is the overall most important symptom to, to treat was um, in intellectual disability and communication. And then you could see amongst the different uh, individual GREE genes, um, how that might shift within, within the different GRI genes. Epilepsy being the second um, most requested symptom to, to focus on and mood disorders and um, behavior and, and what we now know of as neurostorms as well. Um, so I will turn it, we, we have um, four panelists on the, the um, the event today and uh, Dr. Binky was not able to, Dr. Tim Binky from University of Colorado is not um, able to join us in person, but he prepared a video for us all to, to watch. And I will stop sharing here. And Clarissa, if you wanna go ahead and, and load that video. Hello, my name is Dr. Tim Binky and I'm a pediatric neurologist at the University of Colorado. And I'm gonna to talk to you today about GRI disorders, registries for clinical trial readiness and natural history studies. This is a partnership between uh, myself uh, with Dr. Park and Jennifer Sargent at the University of Colorado and Children's Hospital Colorado with Steve Trenellis, Hong Chi Yuan and Scott Myers at Emory University. Uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, uh, important ones are funding for this project, which has been through Simon's Screen 2B Foundation and Cure uh, with Dr. Trey Nellis as the PI. I have been the site PI here. And there are other um, scientific advisory and clinical trials uh, that I have been involved with and all remuneration has been to my department. So our hypothesis is that GRI change uh, plus GRI function will result in unique phenotypes and potentially unique treatments. And so the different features that we have been looking to ascertain have been these listed here, development, developmental milestones, regression, epilepsy, storms, MRI and EEG findings, vision, movement disorders, growth, puberty, medications used for any of these therapies, sleep, behavior, GI issues, autonomic issues, and other illnesses and longevity. Our approach has been to enroll individuals who have any variation in GRIN, GRIA, GRIC, GRID, and associated proteins. We have had funding uh, initially through GRIN2B, and then now more recently through Simons Foundation through 2024. And we've also received funding through su support at the Children's Hospital Colorado Foundation. Uh, this has resulted in key synergies and partnerships both with Dr. Lemke at Leipzig, Dr. Baines at Columbia and Simons Foundation, Dr. Dennis Lau at the Broad Institute, and most importantly through uh, Dr. Trey Nellis uh, at Emory and the Center for Functional Evaluation of Rare Variants. 
uh, we have developed what we're calling the GRIN questionnaire, the TGQ. Uh, this has been updated to match data collection from what is obtained by Dr. Lemke at Leipzig, and it is now in an online version. Uh, this has been updated to reflect parental concerns through interactions with grin 2 b Foundation and Cure Grin. Um, the consent has been updated to allow de-identified data sharing with our partners. Uh, the consent has also been updated to allow recontact for future such studies and updated to allow contact information sharing with patient advisory groups such as grin 2 b and Cure Grin. It's also been updated to allow annual updates. Uh, that IRB has been approved. And because of the changes, those that have been enrolled in the past, uh, we do have to reconsent you. So if you do see a request for reconsent, this is why is because things have changed since we may have initially enrolled you in the past. We now have uh, papers in process. Uh, one of our reviews is now published. The second review, which is a book chapter, uh, we're waiting for the final proofs and that should be published soon. And then we're looking to publish two papers on GRIN1 and GRIN2B in the very near future. So our functional approach has been to uh, perform functional assessments of all GRIN, GRIA, GRIC, and GRID and associated proteins through CFERV and Emory. And this is led by uh, Drs. Trainellis and Yuan. Uh, there's now a revised functional workflow where eight parameters are assessed to determine net effects of changes at synapses and for non-synaptic receptors. Uh, there's now new uh, American College of Medical Genetics, that's ACMG criteria for determining pathogenicity uh, utilizing these functional changes. And this has been spearheaded by Dr. Lemke. Uh, functional quantitative data uh, now goes into the GRIN portal allowing correlation with clinical features. Uh, this is through uh, work that we're all performing. And the GRIN portal will has an algorithm to determine gain of function and loss of function for variance with the complete data set. And this is a feature which is coming soon. And this did require an IRB renewal for this functional work and that's now been approved at Dr. Train Ellis' site at Emory. So this is where we're at. Uh, we're, we're pleased that we've continued to make uh, prog progress. Uh, so we've now had a total of 185 contacts and uh, in some instances, we're awaiting returned consents or mixed in and other genetic results that we're awaiting to come back before we can complete the consent. Our goals are analysis of uh, 50 plus with the GRIN questionnaire and functional analysis for GRIN1, GRIN2A, and 2B each. And these will be combined with variants already collected by Dr. Lemke for further analyses. And so here's where we're at. Um, and you can see that we're uh, getting close to our goals with, with GRIN1, uh, still have a ways to go with GRIN2A. Uh, we've gone past them with GRIN2B, which is great. Um, and here's where we are with all of the others. And again, this is something that's, that's been emerging. And a lot of this has to do with, with these are very rare. And so it's both that coupled with just getting the word out that people can enroll uh, in this study. So uh, just if you're not aware of it, there is the GRIN portal and you can see what the uh, address is up here. It's grin-portal.broadinstitute.org. And this is basically your gateway to information on basic information, information for families, variant analysis, research, and of course, the GRIN registry. Uh, this is what it looks like when you go to the family organizations here. And one of the questions you're going to ask is, where is my functional analysis? So the full analysis is provided to your physician at their request, and they can contact me at tim.benke at cuanchus.edu for this. And it's important to note that gain of function versus loss of function, there are shades of gray. And our view is that this is, this is not clinically actionable, but it is necessary for clinical trial research and natural history studies. Providing this directly to families implies a clinical relationship, and this is a research relationship. And so I think that there could be further discussion on this point, and perhaps this is something we can discuss in the Q&A uh, later on Saturday. 
um, quarterly. The plan is to post these to the GRIN portal um, as these become available. And importantly, uh, there is information on how to enter the GRIN registry uh, on the GRIN portal, but also um, here is that key information here and the main questions, if you haven't enrolled, why haven't you? And if you haven't updated, why haven't you? And it's important to note this is the only pathway to functional analyses to determine gain of function and loss of function. And we believe this is also the pathway through discovering natural history as we collect more information on a yearly basis. Again, this is that uh, web address for that one-stop shop for all. But if you're looking for the unique uh, uh, contact information, this is the contact for Europe, Asia, Africa, or other. And for North, South America, and Australia, it's either uh, Jennifer or, uh, and or Dr. Bain. We're uh, collecting slightly different information, but so we hope that we'll, you'll register with both. So thanks very much. I uh, look forward to your questions uh, at a later time. Okay, Dr. Bain, I believe you're up next. And Dr. Bain is from um, Simons and uh, Columbia University. All right, can you see my slides? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Bain. I'm a child neurologist at Columbia University in New York City, um, but I've also had the pleasure of working with Simon Searchlight, for which I'll be presenting their data today. I'm thrilled to see the significant gains as I met the GRIN community just a few years ago, and it's really exciting to see how much has really continued to happen and forging forward in the virtual era during the pandemic. Today, I'll be speaking on behalf of the Simons Foundation project called Simons Searchlight. I will explain what Searchlight is, how it can benefit families and researchers in the field, and lastly, we'll share some of our data from the GRIN 2B, GRIN 1, and GRIN 2A in order of number of participants. Um, unfortunately, we only have two GRIN 2D registrants, and we can discuss a little bit more about um, why we couldn't include their data today, but we hope to have more of, of that information soon. So what is the goal of Simon Searchlight? The mission of this project is to shed light on these conditions, which are genetic disorders causing neurodevelopmental disorders, collected by high quality natural history study data, and really build strong partnerships between different researchers, as you just mentioned with Dr. Bendke and several collaborators, as well as promote in use of this data for industry and, and families and family meetings such as today. The first step is really to collect detailed medical and behavioral histories, along with bio specimens such as blood samples from families affected by certain genetic disorders, in this case, the GRIN disorders. What Simon Searchlight will do will synthesize all this information that's provided and share those results back to the families, such as we're doing today. The goal of Simons is really to freely share this data and really allow these, this data as well as biospecimens to be shared with qualified researchers in the field and to connect participants as well as researchers from around the world in forums such as this. And the overarching goal is to promote a better understanding of genetic changes and hopefully therapeutic interventions in the future. One of the most exciting things that Simons does allow for is for collection of biospecimens and individuals who, who register for Simon Searchlight have the option to donate blood for research. This can happen remotely using laboratories known as Quest Labs in the United States, but also has happened and continues to happen at in-person family meetings where international participants could also donate their blood. This donated blood is then sent by mail to the Biobank at Rutgers University in New, in New Jersey. And the blood is used to make two types of research resources. One is a cell line, which we're not going to talk too much about today. But on the next slide, I will talk a little bit about the other resource known as an induced pluripotent stem cell or iPS cell. In my next slide, we'll talk a little bit about this and why they're so important. So what exactly is Simon Searchlight doing to enable these studies using iPS cells? As mentioned in the very beginning, participants in Simon Searchlight can donate their blood that's shipped to and stored at the Biobank in New Jersey, Rutgers University. The conversion of blood cells to induce pluripotent stem cells happens at the New York Stem Cell Foundation, and the resulting cells are then again stored back at the Biobank at Rutgers University. 
it takes about six to nine months from rece receiving the actual sample to making these stem cells. And when these stem cells are available, what they can do is be provided back to researchers around the field. All a researcher has to do is provide an agreement with the Simons Foundation to request those samples. We'll review it to ensure that they are a legitimate researcher in the field, and then the samples are shipped to them directly. So who cares about these iPSCs? Well, they're very important cells because what these cells allow are us to actually go back and differentiate or specialize the cell types. For example, in the case of many of these disorders, we're really interested in the brain cells. We're not as interested in the blood cells. And so what we can do is actually take these blood cells, convert them into stem cells, and then specialize them into the cells that we're interested. Some of the cells we've discussed earlier are nerve cells, microglia cells, astrocyte cells, and other types of cells around the body. And this can really allow for specific cell modeling to be done in the dish, as well as potentially do working on drug screening and potentially other drug discovery. So the use of iPSCs can be very important and Simon's Simon's Foundation or Safari really um, saves researchers times and money so that they can focus on the experiments and utilize these resources for very nominal costs. So let's get into what this panel is about, which is about the actual information provided by families to the Simon Searchlight Foundation. First, I'm going to start with the Grin 2B registry in Simon Searchlight. This has been a very active group using the Simon Searchlight platform. And so we'll go through what, what happens when an individual goes on to Simon Searchlight online, which is step one over here on the left. At first, they go online themselves. They don't need a referral. A person can look up their, their specific registration. Um, the next thing they do is they provide their genetic report, which will be reviewed by genetic counselors and specialists at the Simons Foundation to assure that that individual does in fact have um, a grin to be genetic variant. At that point, they will be given questionnaires that are done electronically as well as with phone interviews to share important medical information. They can fill out many different surveys. They then have the opportunity to provide blood samples if interested. And then the Simon Searchlight platform will allow um, an individual to provide updates every year um, about their medical history. And so starting on the left, you can see we've had 116 individuals with GRIN2B sign up. 88 of which have provided genetic reports, which we'll talk about shortly. 66 have completed medical histories. Another 80 um, have filled out surveys that we'll be presenting today. Um, and 34, which is a great number, have provided blood samples. And we'll talk about some of the specific um, resources that have already been, been um, built by the Grin2B community. This is a very exciting study, Simon Searchlight, because it's a long-term study. It's been going on for over a decade now, and the goal really is to gather new information every year from individuals. So this can this is not possible without your participation. The reason why the number of families here is not the same. So we have 28 families who've actually contributed their biospecimens. So 31 individuals with GRIN2B variants. Um, however, 53 family members also provided biospecimens. And from those specimens, there are actually eight induced pluripotent stem cell lines that are currently available with four additional lines that would, will be available in the summer. In the next slide, I'll show you which ones they are specifically. There are an additional eight cell lines that are available, as well as 19 whole blood DNA samples, as well as some saliva DNA as well. This is a list of the various IPSC uh, available resources. So the first, um, the first seven you can see are, are listed up top and then an additional four that are soon coming. Um, two of them are from the same variant listed as number four. So you can see that there's two of them. Um, the, really, this is a very nominal fee that's being asked for um, really just transferring that, that, that data and that material over to researchers. Um, it's about $120 um, per sample to be requested for an individual. Um, and it can be done right online line um, and researchers can um, readily sign up and submit those requests now um, and we're happy to help you with that process. 
This slide summarizes the variants observed in the Grin2B database at this point in time. So we have 80 individuals, and this is as of March 2022. And as you can see, the um, panel on the left is listing all the different missense variants that are pathogenic or likely pathogenic in the group. There are a handful in the top right of frame shift or nonsense, likely pathogenic or pathogenic variants. There's a few with deletions and one additional duplication and one additional splice site variation. All the ones listed here are considered pathogenic or likely pathogenic. There are a few other individuals who may have other variants that are not listed here. Um, and there may be a variety of reasons why they're not included. Their data is collected, but perhaps at this point, their variant is not considered pathogenic or likely pathogenic. So they might not be listed here, but those individuals are continuing to provide information um, if and when those variants are, are changed in terms of their pathogenicity. So today what I'll be presenting are the 52 individuals with pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants who've contributed to that medical history data. And this is through um, online surveys as well as um, discussion on telephone interviews. The most recent history interview that we do, we're listing here. So this is looking at the age of individuals who are participants. And as you can see, the majority of individuals that are engaged in the Simon Searchlight group are young children under the age of 20. There are two adults who are over 20 years old, but as you can see, the majority of people who are really engaged um, in the Searchlight community at this point are individuals in those single digits or perhaps double digits range. And it's really going to be important to continue holding on to these um, groups and, and really engaging them in the community so we can see what happens as, as this curve kind of shifts upward and we start to see individuals moving into those teen years as well as adult years. With regard to the developmental and behavioral diagnoses, and these might be the reasons why individuals had genetic testing in the first place, the vast majority, nearly all, have had a history of developmental delay in their younger years. And as older individuals, they have been given the diagnosis of intellectual disability. That's the blue bar on the top. And a very large percentage, up to three quarters of individuals, also report an, a language impairment, which we'll talk about shortly as well. About a third of individuals have been given a formal diagnosis of autism, and many other individuals have other behavioral concerns such as ADHD or attention problems, anxiety, and obsessive compulsive disorder. Again, these are neurological disorders or neurodevelopmental disorders. The majority of individuals do have reports of low muscle tone or loose tone or kind of a floppiness or um, not a weakness per se, but this might have been a diagnosis such as hypotonia given by one of your medical providers. And another third of individuals also report um, coordination difficulties or problems with motor planning. There are a, a number of individuals who have reported having spasticity or tight or high muscle tone as well as other disorders such as cortical blindness, movement disorders, tick disorders, a small head size or a large head size, and some individuals have been given a diagnosis of cerebral palsy. We're very interested in, in those individuals who provided information about seizures. And so 52 individuals um, completed a questionnaire specifically about seizures, and 10 of those individuals, so 19%, or one in five individuals reported having had at least one seizure in their lifetime. There didn't seem to be one specific type of seizure. They could be petit mal or absence, also known as staring spells. Simple partial would be one small area of the brain that was involved, as well as other types such as grand mal or generalized convulsions, spasms, complex partial seizures, and tonic seizures. There are many additional medical problems that have been reported by individuals with grin 2 b um, Similar to many other neurodevelopmental disorders, 73% um, have complained of gastrointestinal problems, 58% have eye or vision problems, endocrinologic or growth problems in 44%, musculoskeletal orthopedic or joint problems in 21%, GI surgery, such as a G2 for supplemental feeding, um, as well as a few other um, disorders, such as heart problems, cancer, and kidney and urinary problems are not as high on the list, but certainly are reported in the group. 
And when we ask on a different questionnaire what medications individuals are taking, um, just under half of the individuals are taking medications um, for GI problems. About 23% are taking medications for seizures. And on the right, you can see the types of seizure medications that are being utilized. So in the 10 individuals who have, who are, have a history of seizures, two of them reported taking um, Keppra as the most effective medication, one on valproic acid or Depakote, one on phenobarbital, and one on medical cannabis. Other medications that have been reported include respiratory or asthma allergy problems, medications for sleep, 20%. Problems with attention and hyperactivity, cannabis or cannabidiol, antidepressants, beha other behavioral medications, sedative medications, and pain medications. One of the more interesting things that we've been recently taking more interest in is looking at what developmental milestones are being achieved by this group of individuals, um, as well as those with any developmental delay. There's a standardized measure called the Vineland Adaptive Behavior Scale. This is commonly used either in schools or by psychologists or neuropsychologists, and it's also used by the Simon Searchlight Group. This graph is what I think of as a developmental growth chart. On the bottom x-axis, you can see the age of the evaluation. On the y-axis is when you use that Vineland Adaptive Scale, what age are they acting or what age skill set do they have? In this case, 35 individuals reported what they were able to do at these specific ages on the bottom. Each dot represents a different person. For example, the person over here, that individual is an adult who's over 18 years old. However, the person all the way down here was just about uh, probably a few months because they're uh, just over a year of age. And on the left, you can see what age they would be when they use that specific test. Um, when we plot all the different individuals over time with grin 2 b what we can see is that individuals do have a delay in their expressive language. However, individuals do gain skills as they are getting older. And so we can't specifically tell you or predict whether your child will or will not um, gain speech or to what degree. We can say that um, on average, there does seem to be growth over time with the acquisition of expressive language. For example, over half of the children above the age of two are at a level where they are using some language or learning some language. And after the age of 12, nearly 60% have developed more complex functional language. We can use a similar scale looking at motor development in individuals. For example, here, similarly, individuals do continue to gain skills in their motor development. And after turning two, over the half of the children at this group are at the level where they may be walking independently. And this is based on 28 individuals who reported this information. So in summary for, for the grin 2 b group, we can say that common issues are developmental delay, intellectual problems, um, language problems, low muscle tone, eye problems, and GI problems. Some of the less common issues, but certainly are still there, are autism, seizures, coordination problems, growth problems, muscle problems, as well as musculoskeletal problems. And so while the grin 2 b did have the most individuals in their group, we are going to go quickly through the other grin registry information. So next we'll go through grin 1 and we can go through a little more quickly since we're a little more familiar with the format. So for grin 1, 11 individuals have signed up, 10 have provided their genetic report, which I'll show you briefly, 8 have provided their medical history, and 9 have provided some surveys. We don't have any blood samples yet for the GRIN1 group out there, so we hope that we can engage the community with this, um, with this forum this weekend. These are the variants that are observed in the nine individuals. These are all pathogenic or likely pathogenic missense changes in the GRIN1 gene. And onto the medical history. This is eight individuals who provided information. Um, Again, we have no adults in this group. However, we do have um, a, a fair number under the age of five, as well as two individuals who are in their teen years. It will be really exciting and, and important to continue to um, engage these families to, to stay involved and stay engaged with providing their information as they get older. 
Similar to the, the GRIN 2B story, um, many individuals who have the GRIN 1 disorder have developmental delay um, or a diagnosis of intellectual disability when they're older. About three quarters do have language impairment. Um, autism, ADHD, and anxiety are reported in the group as well. Similar to GRIN 2B, there is a low muscle tone in most individuals. Um, there is high muscle tone noted in one individual. Um, coordination problems, movement disorders, as well as cortical blindness are reported um, in a fair number of individuals in the group as well. Out of the eight individuals who, who, have had, who have reported their information, half of them have reported having seizures. Similar to, to what I described earlier, um, there isn't one specific uh, seizure type. They can be grand mal, petite mal, simple partial, or tonic seizures. Um, so seizures seem to be a, a little bit more prevalent. However, again, we're only looking at eight individuals. Additional medical concerns that have been brought up by the GRIN1 community include difficulty with growing or gaining wheat in many individuals, and similarly about 75% with gastrointestinal problems. Eye and vision problems are noted in about 50% of individuals. There seems to be a little bit more with regards to heart problems, genital problems. Um, uh, one individual has had a G2 placed for um, nutrition, um, and there is one individual who reports having orthopedic or musculoskeletal problems. Um, there are eight individuals in the group and seven are taking medication. Most are taking medication for gastrointestinal issues, so 51%. 43% are taking um, seizure medication. On the right, you can see the two medications that have been reported as most effective are Keppra or, or Parampamil by Compa and Levetiracetam. Antidepressants and cannabidiol have also been reported in the group. So in summary, um, similar to what we talked about earlier, developmental delay and intellectual disability is quite common, as well as language impairment, tone problems, coordination and movement problems. Seizures do seem to be a little bit more of a problem in this group. Um, difficulty growing and gaining weight, vision problems, GI problems. Some of the less common issues that are reported, however, are still being noted in the group include cortical blindness, heart problems, and genital problems. And we'll finish up with the GRIN 2A registry and Simon Searchlight. So we do have 15 individuals who have signed up online. Nine have provided their genetic report. Um, five have shared their medical history, um, nine have completed surveys, and we do have one individual who is who has provided a blood sample. And again, we do encourage everybody to, to consider enrolling and, and, and providing information on an annual basis. In the GRIN 2A group, there are nine individuals. The majority of individuals also have pathogenic and likely pathogenic missense variants. However, there is one individual who has a pathogenic splice site variant listed here. There are two other variants of unclear significance that have not been shown, and these are all of the collected data from March, so just last month. In brief, I'd like to say thank you very much. Unfortunately, we don't have much more information from the group at this point, but we really wanna thank the community for being engaged and using Simon Searchly to continue gathering information um, to share back with you and to share with other researchers. I'm happy to answer any other questions. And I really wanna thank you because this wouldn't have been possible without your um, willingness to participate in the Simon Searchly community. Thank you and have a nice day. Thank you, Dr. Bain. Um... I know we have a couple of questions in the, the chat and I, I know we were um, we have some time allocated towards the end, but I just wondered if there's something specific to your presentation. Um, I, I know the question has been asked with these various registries, sometimes these um, questions can be technical. Is there somebody at, um, at Simons that can help with the, the answering some of these more technical questions? So what I'll say from Simons is that um, families do sign up online, but they do get to speak with humans as well. Um, so there are specific coordinators. And I think Curtis was in the, Curtis Weaver is in the chat right now. He's one of the research coordinators. Um, they will work with individuals on a one-by-one -one basis to make sure that all their questions are answered, um, that they're requesting the information that we need and that um, we're giving you the information that you need. Um, certainly it is a process. So for Dr. Benke's 
study with Dr. Trinellis. Jennifer Sargent will sit down and go through the project with you step by step. Um, there is what we call a consenting process, meaning that um, to be an ethically sound study um, anywhere around the world, um, an individual will sit down with a family and tell them the risks, the benefits, and the entire process um, to really be uh, transparent about the process, what you're being asked to provide. Um, and that's an opportunity before, um, before you sign on any line to say, to ask any questions, to, to provide any feedback so that you really are clear about what information you're being asked to provide, um, what you're getting yourself into, since this is very personal information, um, and really what will happen with that data and that information over time. Um, so I, I, I encourage families to really even just ask um, because, even just asking um, might answer some questions, provide some relief. Um, I think parents are not always sure what they want to sign their own kids up for. Um, and, and a lot of this is just data information and collecting information from parents. Um, and we really need to know the good, the bad, and, and the ugly to get a good understanding for what's going on and what's affecting families. Um, again, an email or a phone call does not imply that all of your information will be shared. There is a full consenting process um, where you have the opportunity to, to talk through what information you want to share, um, what information you might not want to share. Um, just because you sign up does not mean you have to donate blood, um, go through these processes, etc. cetera. Um, really, I think any information families are willing to provide can be helpful for, for the big picture. Hope thank that answers you. your question. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and just one more question, and maybe this isn't, can be answered um, here, but from a, a parent's perspective, if uh, parents have provided blood blood samples to other um, universities, um, it certainly would be beneficial for to be able to share that with um, with other organizations such as Simon's. So I will go, I'll go the other direction. So Simon's basically, uh, one family once said to me, Simon's is almost like the, the library. Um, Simon's will collect all this information, will collect these biospecimens and they freely will share that um, with other providers. At this point, and, and I think my Simon's colleagues in the background can, can chime in if I'm wrong, I don't think we can collect information from other locations, unfortunately, because it is a specific preservation process, um, but they are very happy happy to work with individuals and, and, and answer any questions they might have. I think that's one of the hardest things um, that families and research teams and patient advocacy groups um, are faced with because they want to um, move the field forward, but you also don't want to give blood samples out all over the place. Um, we're, we're all children and we want to take care of everybody and really try to consolidate as much as we can. Um, Dr. Benke had mentioned that Dr. Benke, Dr. Trinellis, Dr. Lemke, and myself are really trying to work together so that all of this information information can really be housed together. So we're not duplicating efforts um, mm -hmm. to, to give everybody parent um, survey burnout. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and blood draw burnout. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, um, so we're going to move on with um, Dr. Alan Bayat from uh, Philadelphia Epilepsy Hospital in Denmark. Hi, um, one second. So, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, my name is Alan. I'm a medical. I have a medical background. I'm a pediatric neurologist in Denmark, um, and working at an epilepsy hospital. But we are primarily interested in genetic epilepsies, but in general, uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, I've been working on my PhD for the past three years, and now it's done. Um, and I have focused my interest on GRIA um, genes and GRIA-related disorders. And we are actually doing exactly the same as Tim Benka um, and Trinellis, but I'm collaborating closely with uh, Johannes uh, Lemke. So I will give you an update about um, overall the GRIA phenotypes that we know of. Um, I'll give you an insight about the uh, Leipzig registry. Um, um, Tim made it easy for me, so it'll be more or less what he said. But uh, down below, you have my um, em email contact. Um, and if any grief families out there are interested with help to go through the registry, I would be 
willing to help them with some of the technicalities if they have problems. Um, so let's let's begin. So I wanted to give you an insight about GRIA to just understand the, the background. So in the brain, we have two very important types of cells, two different neurons. The yellow one are what we call the ex excitatory neurons. These are the ones that kind of generate uh, electricity um, and activating cells around them. Then we have the inhibitory neurons that are kind of shutting down the excitatory neurons. So it's very simple that there has, there is constant um, a balance between excitization and inhibition. Um, and if a mutation occurs in a patient with GRIN or GRIA-related disorder, then it'll shift this um, balance between inhibition and excitization, for example, in, in another direction. So you might have too much inhibition or you might have too much excitization, and that causes uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. So what we're interested in today is to talk about the um, GRIA genes that encode the AMPA receptors, and the AMPA receptors are located here on the cell surface of these excitatory neurons. They're located just be um, beside the um, NMDA receptors uh, that are encoded by the GRIN genes. So this is what a, um, an AMPA receptor looks like uh, and what it does. So it's located here in the cell surface, and you can see that once it closed, it doesn't really create any current, but when it opens, the current goes up, and then when it closes, the current go down. And what happens is, if you have a mutation that um, that destroys the channel, um, then it'll be the, the current will be um, either completely flat. Um, there will be no current, or you, it'll be diminished. So this is what we call loss of function mutations. But we can also have mutations that um, have the opposite effect where the channel stays open too long. So you have a gain of function, the current is too high or it doesn't really go down. Um, so that's how the channel works. This is another figure of the channel just to show you that it's made out of different subunits. So it's currently made out of four different subunits. Um, and you can see that these are identical pairs. So you have two subunits here that, for example, are often encoded by the GRIA2 or GRIA3 genes. And then you have another pair of uh, subunits encoded by uh, one of the other genes. So there are four genes, as you know. Uh, and they encode these uh, subunits that go together uh, and create the AMPA receptor. So what do we know based on the available literature uh, that has already been published? Well, we know that all patients have a global developmental delay that is apparent very, very early um, in life. So it's, it starts in infancy or, or in early childhood, but there is a range in symptoms. So some can be very mildly affected while others may be profoundly affected, more severely affected. So I'm highlighting the mild spectrum and the severe. And then of course, there'll be a lot of patients that will be in the middle. So in the mild spectrum, we have boys and girls that develop completely normal for the first three to six months. They reach their developmental milestones and parents have no idea and neither do clinicians that there's anything wrong with them. And then about three to six months of age, they start either stop, they regress, so they stop developing further, or they may even lose some of the milestones that they have uh, learned. And uh, what we know is the problems that they face are, for example, um, um, motor co uh, coordination problems, motor coordination problems with social interaction, language uh, abilities early in childhood. Um, the mildest patients learn to walk, they even learn to run, but may have an unsteady gait. Some don't have epilepsy and they never develop epilepsy. Those that have epilepsy uh, are easily treated with medication. Um, and the epilepsy seems to start very early in life, so around six to 12 uh, months of life. So that's in the mildest uh, spectrum that we know of. In the severe spectrum, patients, the children, the infants are affected just after birth, just the first day, the first hours of birth. Um, 
you can see that they're either very, very flaccid, so they're hypotonic with a reduced body tone, or they can be very, very stiff. Um, they might have feeding difficulties because of this, um, these uh, tone problems. They might be very limited or no uh, eye contact. Um, and eventually, some of these patients in the most severe end of the spectrum may never learn how to walk or speak or interact which is really sad. Um, and they often tend to have early onset um, epilepsies that are really difficult to treat despite treating them with several different kinds of medication. So that's a spectrum. Um, and, and then there's those that are in the mild or in the severe and those that are in the middle. There's also additional symptoms and I'm just mentioning uh, on a few of them, there are a lot of uh, behavioral problems, um, autistic features. So not all have a formal autism diagnosis, but they have features that 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 uh, seems to be these uh, limited social interactions, um, repetitive behaviors. Some may have uh, be very hyperactive. They can have reduced attention spells. They may have short temper, be aggressive either towards themselves or their surroundings, be anxious, or be very sensitive towards external uh, stimuli. So loud noises, too much noise, too many inputs can really affect them. They may have, stere have stereotypies, which, for example, can be hat fla flapping of the hands, rocking of the head, or rocking of the body. Um, there are often speech impairment. Um, the majority um, have no or very limited meaningful speech. Some can communicate with short sentences or short uh, or simple words. As I said, there are problems with uh, both gross and fine motor skills. So um, some patients have um, hypotonia, so reduced um, body tone, while others are very stiff, are very irritable, and they may later progress to have spasticity or cerebral palsy. And these patients, all of them have this wide, unsteady uh, gait. Some have completely purposeful use of hands, but have fine motor problems, for example, um, you know, buttoning your shirt or uh, drawing, um, while others um, have had uh, purpose purposeful use, use of hands, but lost it uh, early in life, and then others may never have reached um, um, an, an, a normal use of hands, so they're, they're, they might not even be able to hold or grasp something um, on purpose. Then there's a lot of patients that do seem to have um, different sleep issues. So sleep can be normal, but um, in some, um, they can have uh, problems falling asleep or staying asleep, um, which uh, is really a problem for some. We know of patients that can stay awake for more than one and a half day, which is really um, devastating for both caregivers and the patients themselves. So some of the important questions is, we know a lot about uh, the phenotypical spectrum of GRIA-related disorders, but there's still really much to learn. So how do we better understand the phenotypical spectrum? Um, and how do we understand why some mutations give some symptoms while others give other symptoms? So why are some patients only mildly affected? Why are others more severely affected? So why is there this genotype, phenotype correlation? Um, and can we identify any clinical biomarkers? So um, we might have a family with a, with, a, with a son or a daughter who has a mutation in one of the GRIA genes. Um, and what we want to know is, is this, is this gene uh, likely to give a loss of function in the AMPA receptor, or is it going to give a um, gain of function. So our lab and Stuptronalysis lab will be able to solve this question, but um, we're and not all people know of us um, and some may just not have access to us. So what we actually want to find out is what if a patient has very early stiffness, for example, early in life, could that be a sign of overactivity um, in the in the GRIA receptor and could could uh, 
could hypertonia or being flaccid, for example, be a sign of um, a loss of function? So these are the, some of the clinical biomarkers that we are trying to identify in order to counsel the families uh, and other, other clinicians to, to try to, to find uh, proper treatments. So in order to reach some of these, uh, to answer some of these questions, of course, we need to have a database. Um, and as you heard, there is the US database um, that is actually pretty much um, the same questions as in the Leipzig database, but as you saw, um, they have collected an amazing number of uh, patients with brain disorders. Um, our group in Diana Lund, in Danish Epilepsy Center, have worked with the Lemkes group for the past uh, five to 10 years. And during the last year, we have joined forces and now the, the GRIN database is also a GRIA database. Um, we haven't started uh, to formally collaborate with uh, Tim Benke and Steve Trenelis, but surely uh, this is something we need to do as well for GRIA uh, related disorders. Um, so you have already seen this slide. So this is an easy way to get to the GRIN registry. I'll jump over this. There's also this link up here that is that will immediately get you to the registry, but why choose that when you can go through the green portal? So once you go to the green portal, if you haven't been there yet, you will uh, you will get some questions on the first uh, pages. So you need to, of course, give the name of your child, uh, your own name, your own contact information, for example, email. Then you need to agree to share clinical data with us by saying yes and yes and yes. So you declare that you're then under the nurse. So the, these data are, of course, uh, it might be the referring clinician. So we'd really like to know whether it's the clinician or it's the family that are giving the data. So you'll be asked for this. And then over here on the right, um, when, when you start typing in about the genetic information, of course, you can choose which of these genes, either the GRIN or the uh, Greek or the GRIA, which of these genes uh, are relevant for your uh, child. And then if, <laughs> um, so putting, filling out this database takes time. Um, it might take a few hours, so you might get tired uh, and want to do it over a few days. So you can always save and, and get back to it here by clicking down here. And then be aware that you will get a return key and a return link that you need to access the database again. Um, and if you if you lose it, just contact me or contact, uh, well, contact me, uh, feel free to contact me and I can help you to get the link back. Um, so these are some of the questions that we will ask. So there will be questions about the family history, birth, pregnancy, the early developmental milestones. There'll be additional symptoms that we're asking for, comorbidities, whether um, there has been any epileptic seizures, and if so, um, what kind of seizures, if you have EEG reports, you can upload the reports so we can have a look at it for you. Any MRIs, brain MRIs that have been done. And again, additional questions about, for example, problems with gastrointestinal tract, uh, uh, puberty, et cetera. You've already heard a little bit about this. So, Currently, we are very lucky to have 30 patients with GRIA-related disorders uh, in the database. Um, it's mostly children, but we do have a handful of adults. So this figure is just to show what it is that I'm trying to do here during the next three years for my research. I will start, of course, with the data uh, uh, that we have collected from uh, the GRIA families. Then in our lab, I will try to take the human variants that we have. If we don't know whether the variants are actually affecting the AMPA receptor, I will try to look at it um, in a cell module. I'll try to do some patch clamming and try to determine down here whether the specific mutation is affecting the AMPA receptor and if it's giving a gain of function or loss of function. And we'll try to see if there are any medications um, available that 
um, can reverse these gain of functions, for example, block the receptor if it's too active or open with the receptor if it's closed, um, and then eventually get back to you or your clinicians to tell you the results of these and hopefully help you to find precision medicine um, if it's available uh, or um, if it comes on the market for future studies. So that's basically it. And once again, below are my contact information. Feel free to contact me if we haven't already been in contact, um, especially if you are a um, caregiver family for patients with GRIA. Uh, related disorders. That's it. Thank you, Dr. Bayat. Um, we, I, I know that we do have <coughs> links for the registration on the Kurgan website, but we'll be adding the, the GRIN portal there as well so folks can find it more, more easily. We did have a general question in, in the chat that I think um, we'll probably you, you can answer. One that we get a lot is that if if there um, if we share a variant with another another patient, that particular variant could we and that particular variant is loss of function or gain of function. Will that variant always be loss of function, gain of function, or does the are there sometimes changes within that the functional analysis? Um, I would say it's pretty fixed. So if if we find that it is a loss of function. So um, it's two things to say about this. So there are different um, technical tests that you can do to express these AMPA receptors. Um, and if you only look at one subunit, you might find on a few variants that it is a loss of function. And then when you assemble the, the subunits, you might find out that it is actually uh, something else. Um, but <laughs> Sorry, my, my little boy is coming to say hello. Um, <laughs> say hi. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, the short answer is yes, it's, it's fixed. So if something is a loss of function, then it is a loss of function. Uh, and if it's a gain of function, then it is, it is a gain of function. But of course, the, the, the lab work needs to be um, done correctly and uh, properly. But I guess um, those labs that are involved are doing a tremendous good work. So long answer, sorry. Great, thank you so much. And now for our last speaker, we have uh, Dr. Jeffrey Swanson from uh, Northwest, Northwestern University. Okay, thanks for inviting me to, to talk about our work on uh, um, GRIC genes. Um, you probably haven't heard too much about those um, because so far there are the fewest number of patients that have been identified with uh, variants in this particular family of glutamate receptors. So I've titled this GRIC phenotype, GRIC2 and beyond, um, just to make the point that GRIC2 is not the only kinate receptor gene that variants exist in in patients. Um, but I also want to point out that there is really no GRIC phenotype as uh, in, in the singular sense. There is a variety of phenotypes, even among um, patients or individuals with the same Variant. So we shouldn't think of or, or search for a single defining phenotype. So the, the way I personally entered into this field was through this young lady um, now several years ago. At the time, um, she was quite young and she was diagnosed with Angelman's like phenotype, um, global developmental delay, like it's seen in many patients, and hypotonia. Uh, characteristically very social and smiling often, and um, now she is uh, much older and she has developmental delay, intellectual disability, um, an ataxic gait and choreoapatoid movements, so involuntary movements and postural um, abnormalities. But one thing I also want to point out is that her MRI is, is um, normal. She doesn't have any kind of structural um, changes at the level of the MRI. So whole exome sequencing found a GRIC2 variant that changed the protein um, encoding residue 657 from an alanine to a threonine. And I should warn you in advance that I'm going to talk about phenotypes <clears throat> both in the humans, but also uh, to a, a small extent in the mouse model that we've made um, for this uh, the variant that this young lady has. 
as uh, Alan showed, this is what a receptor looks like. In this case, is a canate receptor. And because um, you know, canate receptors are, are probably not um, familiar to most people, I want to point out that they're the GRIP1 to 5 genes. They are responsible for a variety of functions in the CNS um, that are not as well characterized as AMPA and NMDA receptors, but include um, balancing excitation and inhibition, fine tuning neuronal excitability, and other functions that I've shown here. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is all the reported variants thus far change protein structure in this little um, boxed domain. That's an important domain for communicating between where glutamate binds in this LBD or ligand binding domain and where the channel pore opens here in the membrane. But there are other variants outside of that specific um, domain that we haven't reported yet. Um, so this is the, uh, right now, the comprehensive list that, that I know of. Um, you can see there are variants in GRIC2 and GRIC3 and GRIC5 that are damaging. I apologize for all the abbreviations, but global developmental delay is GTD and autism spectrum disorder is ASD. The uh, purple box um, shows the variants that we reported recently. And also it shows that there are um, a number of individuals that we've, um, collected information from with the same variant. So this is alanine 657 that uh, the first patient had, and then a couple others with conserved variants, uh, conserved mutations. Um, but again, there are other variants in GRIC3 and GRIC5. Interestingly, in GRIC5, uh, nearly well, all of the, the patients with variants in that gene um, have autism spectrum disorder uh, that we've uh, identified. The other um, specific variant that I want to point out is one that um, was just communicated to us from the clinicians, and that is this loss of function uh, terminating variant, um, which is, would be the first such in the GRIC2 um, gene, and that, that person has uh, autism. Okay, so um, the, I told you in this box, this is where the variants occur that we've described. And they have two general um, kinds of effects on receptor function. The first one is this um, isoleucine 668 variant. And that um, is thought to disconnect the um, energetics of binding in this LBD area to channel gating. So it, it is a receptor, it gets made, it gets put on the plasma membrane, it just doesn't work very well as a channel. And then there are a couple of variants that destabilize the closed conformation. So that means that the channel will just tend to pop open um, very easily, even when there's only perhaps one glutamate bound to one of these four subunits. And so um, I don't, don't want to belabor the currents here that, that you can see these are currents from HEK cells transfected with different mutant receptors that we, this is a way in which we characterize how the function of these channels change, and it's very similar to what has been described previously as trying to understand whether they're gain of function or loss of function mutations in these genes. And uh, the point I want to make here is that it's actually quite difficult to determine that, you know, categorize them either as gain of function or loss of function in many cases. And I'll tell you what it is. So here on the left side is what we call the wild type GLUK2 receptor. And we're putting on glutamate in the gray bar for a very short time or a longer time. That's um, to measure different parameters about channel function. And here are the, the four variants that we described recently. So what I think you can uh, hopefully appreciate is that if we look at specifically this A657T, which is alanine 2 3 mean change um, that was originally described uh, in, the, in Katie, the young lady I showed you before, we would call that a gain of function because there's more current passing through the receptor during a specific amount of time, and it's more sensitive to glutamate. And so I boxed on the right side here in our little table, you can see that deactivation, one of these parameters we measured goes from 2.5 milliseconds up to 212, so about a tenfold or a hundredfold change is slower. And um, a similar sort of um, slowing of a different parameter called desensitization. So in most ways, we would characterize that as a gain of function mutation. Um, and then on the other side, we have this loss of function mutation. And it's a loss of function because 
the um, channel gating is faster, so it stays open a shorter period of time, and it lets less current, lets uh, less ions through the channel. And there is uh, much less of this receptor expressed on the plasma membrane as well. So there are fewer receptors and less current going through the receptor. So that's a pretty easy um, way to categorize this channel as a loss of function. But then there are these uh, receptors that are somewhere in the middle. They have features of both gain of function and loss of function. And that would be these 660 variants. So they get very much slower so that you can see deactivation again goes from 2.5 by 100 fold slower, 260. Um, but at the same time, there are many fewer receptors of, these, uh, of this type made that make it to the plasma membrane to be functional. So, they're slower, but there are fewer. So what that means in terms of gain of function, loss of function is not really obvious. Um, so, so, and the other um, thing to keep in mind is that these are analyses of defined receptor combinations. So I, what I just showed you was a, co a comparison of all GLUK2 receptors, what we would call this a homomeric GLUK2 receptor. And then um, some of the GLUK2 mutant receptors or variants again, all of the same subtype. So these are both homomeric receptors. And the differences between the receptor parameters are going to be greatest in this type of comparison. But if we think about what that means um, in, in, a, in a human, in a, in a mouse, in any kind of organism where these receptors exist in their native form, in fact, it's not as simple as that. So we have other, um, in fact, de novo variants occur on one allele of two. So you get a mixture of the wild type and the mutant allele when these receptors are assembled. You also have other subunit proteins that complex with the receptor. So in the case of canate receptors, you might get a blue K5 subunit. So that's in blue. And now your, your uh, variant protein is really only one of the four proteins that make up this receptor. And then it gets even a little more complex because they have proteins called auxiliary proteins. In the case of candy receptors, that would be something called NETO2, which also bind and change channel function. So when you get to something that is approaching uh, a receptor, it looks like a, a, a normal neuronal receptor, it gets pretty tough to, to understand whether this is really a gain of function, a loss of function, or somewhere in between that's tough to predict. Um, but it, doing this sort of analysis, is, as I think you can appreciate um, from the other talks, it does inform predictions about what might be happening in, in um, patients and also in um, other uh, organisms. So I want to just touch upon um, the two, uh, the phenotypes of two uh, of individuals with two variants, the alanine greening variant I mentioned previously. And the idea here is to try and understand whether there is a genotype phenotype correlation. That is, do individuals with the same variant um, show the same behavioral developmental um, phenotype? And I'll give you the answer is to the first approximation, they do. And so in the case of individuals with this variant, they all have initial diagnoses of hypotonia or developmental delay. They share intellectual disability. And um, I think most um, notably, they also um, share this delayed motor development that um, sort of plateaus or stabilizes it's in a toxic or unbalanced gait. So they have a wide range of balance um, related um, issues. And similarly, along with some other aspects of this, their disorder. There are some um, features or phenotypes that are found in, in one or, or a set of the seven individuals. And if we compare um, those individuals to the, the folks with the T660 or the 3 and 660 variant, you can see that these also are fairly conserved in terms of their phenotype, but they're very, very different from the, the um, kids with the 657 variant. So they have um, initial diagnoses often of seizures. And in the case of these individuals, the lysine variant is, uh, seems to be much more severe than the arginine variant. 
Um, so they all have intellectual disability. The, lice, the folks with the lysine variant have, are not ambulatory or they have limited degree of walking. Um, the lysine, the kids with the lysine variant have epilepsy, quite uh, serious epilepsy that's often refractory in most cases, and then cortical, cortical visual impairments. So, and then perhaps um, the, the thing that really um, uh, distinguishes them from the other group of kids is that they do have um, structural abnormalities in their MRIs. And um, that is sort of surprising because these channels, you probably can appreciate from my quick overview of the currents, these look very similar to the alanine 657 3 variants in terms of their, their function in a dish when we record their currents. We, we had the opportunity to look at a series um, of MRIs taken from one of the kids. Um, and what I think you can hopefully appreciate is that you have uh, these structural abnormalities that include thinning of the corpus callosum. You have uh, hyperintensities and increased volume in the um, extra axial spaces. And then um, you see some initial signs of atrophy in the hippocampus, and it's not as obvious here. The hippocampus is this little structure here. Cerebellum also shows some initial signs of atrophy, although it's not as obvious in these MRIs. Dr. Swanson, I, I just wanted to let you know we're, we have two minutes left. And okay. Apologize. Okay, well, then I'll, I'll pretty much wrap it up because um, I'm about halfway through, so... Uh, Okay, so why don't I just um, stop here then and say that missense mutations and candidate receptor genes can be causative for neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, and the variants that alter their function in a similar way, in a, like I said, in a dish, can cause very different phenotypes in the children. And that includes one that um, possibly causes a degenerative um, phenotype. And at least in the small population of uh, of individuals, there does seem to be a genotype phenotype relationship. And I will skip over the mouse stuff. <laughs>